I'm excited about today's webinar titled Building a Culture of Care, which will examine how farms, plants, and other businesses ensure that animal care is a core value and component to their company's culture. This discussion will be moderated by Dr. Michelle Calvo Lorenzo, Chief Animal Welfare Officer at Elanco Animal Health. Dr. Calvo Lorenzo's bio, as well as all of our full speaker bios, are available on the Virtual Summit website, and we'll drop that link in the chat box as well. With that, I will turn things over to Dr. Calvo Lorenzo. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, very, very honored and excited to be here to discuss with our panel this topic called Building a Culture of Care. Uh, but first, would like to again thank you, Hannah, and to the Animal Ag Alliance and all of the sponsors for hosting this virtual summit. I've attended all the pre-conference webinars and just thoroughly have enjoyed them and really appreciate the small distraction from the, the craziness of today's uh, current circumstances. Um, and with that, I also hope that all the viewers and listeners out there are safe and finding all the resources they need to overcome and survive these extreme COVID circumstances we're living through today. Again, we're all in this together and I hope we can continue to lean on one another as an industry, as a medical and scientific community, and also as a society. So, to get back to the topic of uh, today's panel, i um, very excited that we have three wonderful speakers to speak on a very important topic that I know is very, very important and, and strongly tied to animal welfare. Um, as Hannah mentioned, there was a wonderful webinar yesterday that talked about the scientific tools um, and, and scientific strategies um, in, in, in measuring and understanding animal welfare. Um, so when we typically think about animal welfare, we usually think through the lens of the animals. So we're typically very animal centered in our approaches. But today our panel is actually going to talk about a different and kind of indirect approach to optimizing animal welfare. And that's um, by looking at the people dimension of animal welfare. Um, and by that, what I mean is we're going to be looking through the lens of the caretakers, those folks that tend to animals, livestock and poultry day in and day out. Um, and this is a very important aspect of animal welfare that our industries need to continue considering and developing strategies for because when we think about the very basics of these livestock animals they're domesticated animals which really rely on their human caretakers for all of their needs and their wants. Um, and so it's important that as we think about all of the new strategies out there to really optimize animal welfare, um, and there's many new ones out there, uh, but we gotta think and take into consideration the people aspect of this. Um, and so it's important to think about things like empowering our caretakers, removing barriers and challenges, establishing positive workplace cultures or a culture of care like we're talking about today, um, and find ways that we can continue to boost employees morale and satisfaction because it truly is a win-win-win when you have employees that feel empowered, confident, and content in what they do every day on the farm. It builds a wonderful human-animal interaction or bond between that caretaker and the animals they tend. And ultimately, it, it leads to um, optimized animal welfare outcomes, all, all of which we are trying to advance every single day to enhance the quality of life for the animals and for their caretakers, right? So I uh, just, just wanted to set the stage and just make, again, our audience realize that animal welfare is very complex. Um, and sometimes it can be optimized with strategies that take our four-legged friends into consideration, but sometimes we got to think about our two-legged friends as well, right? So with that, um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panel of wonderful speakers. We've got three fantastic speakers for you today. Today, uh, we're first going to speak with or hear from Dr. Robert Hagevoort, uh, who's an extension dairy specialist and associate professor at New Mexico State University. And so Dr. Hagevoort works individually with dairies and collectively with producer associations on implementing and evaluating comprehensive workforce training programs in dairy safety, animal handling, parlor performance, calf care, feeder performance, and hospital and maternity care. Our next panelist is going to be Max Ursik, who's the bull market president and manager at Keiko Isom. Having operated his family's farm and cow operations, Ursik brings firsthand knowledge of the daily issues which farm and ranch operations face. In his role, he, uses, he utilizes his specialization in livestock as well as row crop operations to help clients successfully optimize, expand, and tradition their agribusinesses. And last but not certainly least is Josh Lind, who's a pig farmer and general manager in the Heartland region, 
with the Mashoffs. Lind has a passion for raising pigs that goes back to when he was growing up on the family farm. He joined the Mashoffs in 2009, and in 2017, he was promoted to general manager of the Heartland region, which finishes approximately 1.6 million market hogs annually. So with that, folks, those are three fantastic speakers today. So we'll go ahead and turn it over to our first panelist, Dr. Hagevort. If you can uh, share your screen, um, I'll go ahead and turn the stage over to you. Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Robert Hagerford, the Extension Specialist with New Mexico State University. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, get my uh, screen shared and the presentation going. Um, and uh, assuming that everybody can see what uh, the presentation is in front of us. Um, Talking more about this building a culture of care, we, we've heard that being utilized probably in the last year or two many, many times. And uh, the, the interesting thing about that, that phrase is um, a lot of times when we talk about animal welfare, animal well-being, and I use these words a little bit intermittently, and, and uh, we almost talk about this as an abstract concept as something that we either decide we're going to do or we're not going to do, we're going to adhere to, we're going to sign up for, we're going to embrace uh, as something that we decide we're going to do as if it were to live in a vacuum. However, when we think about this a little bit more, it does not. It is not something you decide. It is, and as a matter of fact, it is an outcome uh, of a interaction between a human and an animal. Um, because these animals live and we take care of them, uh, they live on our farms, uh, ultimately it is us that provide that uh, and, and entertain that interaction. And so it's an outcome. It is not an abstract uh, process or concept. It's something that is an outcome of, of a process in which involves both a human and an animal. So first piece to that equation is the animal component. And we've, uh, as far as cattle is concerned, and dairy breeds, we've domesticated those now about 10,000 years ago, selecting for acceptable temperament, animals that we can work with, that, uh, that, that we can have around us without us being heard by, getting hurt by a large animal. Um, the animal has hit its innate behavior despite the domestication, its natural instinct, as we refer to. And on top of that, there's a learned behavior. The interaction that they've had during their lifetime with us is what they have learned to be either good or bad. They have experiences and they interpret those experiences. So what we see is both the combination of the innate behavior and the learned behavior. Secondly, there is that human component, uh, that person that's actually taken care of that animal. Um, there's a, I have an iceberg in this slide. Why? Because there's a portion of the human that we can see, the interaction that we actually see how the person behaves in him or herself around us or around the animals. Uh, the, the combined effect of their knowledge and their skill set that they've learned over time. But there's a much bigger part underneath there that we really don't know a whole lot about, which is their attitude and their character, which is very difficult to change. What we can change in that human is, of course, their knowledge and their skill set, uh, the understanding, comprehension, and awareness, what we have learned so far through experience, in this case, working with animals. Then we develop a skill set, ability, expertise, mastery, capability, which is coming from one's knowledge. Those are the things that we can impact as managers, owners, working with people that, that work on our farms. The part that we may have a little harder time with is the attitude and the character, disposition, viewpoint, frame of mind. It is what we bring to the job. It is what, who we are. So if we talk about the reality on dairy farms today, one, dairies are larger in terms of numbers of cows, and that is a world, 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 worldwide trend. Uh, larger dairies, of course, employ many more people. Uh, approximately one employee per 100 cows, and that number is, is rapidly increasing as well. Um, employees are not just family labor anymore. In many cases, it's hired labor, and they are nowadays usually from a different or cultural linguistic and linguistic background, foreign-born labor as we refer to it. 
employment is often not based on skills. Uh, it is oftentimes based on the willingness to perform a task. We really don't know or have very limited or unknown uh, um, understanding about the education and training, especially with the, the workers that come to the job uh, for the first time. Of course, if they've worked for us for a longer time, we may know a whole lot more, but a lot of times we really don't know what kind of training, what kind of education pertaining to animal handling or pertaining to agricultural safety that these people may have had or may have or may bring. So they may not be familiar working with and around large herding, herding animals or large equipment. So in that sense, we have an industry that is in transition from a family owned and operated uh, uh, endeavor to a much larger, larger company with a lot of employees. And we have very little performance metrics pertaining to our workforce. Many for cows, not so many for our workforce. So the question really is, how does the level of knowledge about large herding animals affects the person's animal handling skills? And as an outcome, their safety as they are working in that position, but also the well-being of those animals that they take care of. And so if we try to put that into a graph, which of course is what we do in, in science and in academia, we want graphs, we want to picture everything that we think about. And if we want to improve human well-being or human performance, I, I use that word also for that well-being, human performance, how can we train and educate these, these workers to where they can do a better job or better understand what it is that they're doing or the why of what it is that they're doing? We know there is a relationship to the animal well-being. However, we don't know if that is actually, as it is depicted here, a linear relationship or not. So if I improve their understanding of, of working with animals twofold, does that mean that the animal well-being and performance then also improves twofold? We really don't know that. What we do know that, and this is from a lot of dairy safety training, that awareness training that we've done, is a couple of things when it comes to our employees. And here are some numbers that I want to share with you. So here, they're uh, taking about 1,400 employees that we've got data on that did these uh, safety awareness training uh, in, on dairies throughout the US. This is not just in, in our state, New Mexico, but it's throughout the US. We know that uh, the, in, as far as their position is concerned, about a third of them were milkers, uh, about 5% feeders, and then the rest was general workers, caretakers of calves uh, on the farm. Um, all kinds of other positions on the dairy. Years of experience, about seven and a half years, push on minus nine. The interesting part here in blue is that we're dealing with a population that has a limited level of education coming to the job. Uh, as you can see there, about 60% has a fifth gr grade level education or below. So what we do in terms of training has to be targeted to that group of, uh, of employees. We talk about their country of origin. If, if I would have done this study, say, five or 10 years ago, I probably would have found that about 80 or 90 percent of our employees would have uh, come from uh, Mexico. One thing that we're starting to see, and that's indicated here in blue, that about one third of our workforce is no longer coming from Mexico, but from Central America. And that has implications. And we'll talk about that in a minute. For one, one of the implications is that the language tends to change. Uh, what we have found is in 22.4% of the employees, their native language is Quiche, uh, a Mayan language out of Central America, one of the 23 uh, Mayan languages that, that are uh, there in Central America and in the primary language in which a, a lot of the Central Americans communicate amongst themselves. A lot of those native Quiche speakers may not speak Spanish. If they've not gone to school in their uh, country of origin, they may not have learned Spanish as a language. So that creates issues uh, when, uh, when we're dealing with these employees in terms of training and educating on the farm. What we've learned is that the large majority of the employees no longer is coming from an ag background. They have, the large majority has no experience in working with large animals or equipment. As I said, about 60% of the employees has a fifth grade level education or below. There's a very high level of illiteracy or low reading comprehension amongst those employees. And that has nothing to do with age. We've seen that in uh, very young 
uh, employees as well. There's a very high level of labor turnover on these dairies, especially in the first six to uh, 12 months. Um, and there is a shift going on in the typical workforce, ma uh, workforce makeup to now more Central Americans, which means a different culture that is added to the mix besides the Anglo uh, culture now and the Hispanic culture. We also now have the Mayan or the indigenous culture. We've added a language to the mix besides English and Spanish. We have now Quiche added to the mix. And we've also added another body stature or build for most of these people from Central America to the mix. This is an example of that. This is in a parlor where on the left picture, you can see two employees, uh, one a Hispanic worker who is working milking cows, attaching machines uh, pretty much right in front of him uh, with not, you know, right in his wheelhouse, so to speak. In the background, you can see another worker who is, as you follow the railing of the, uh, the, the milking parlor where the cows are at, you can see he is much smaller in statue. He's from Central America. And, uh, and of course, if you look at the person in the right picture, is that person up close. And as you can see, if he is hanging, when he is hanging machines, he is really not working in his wheelhouse. It's kind of extended to hang those machines and to push buttons. So the question really you need to ask yourself is which one of these two people in, in the theory would, would fatigue much quicker than the other? The person that's working within his wheelhouse or the person that has to reach up in order to hang machines. So this stature, body stature, has implications for how we need to design dairies, how we need to design parlors, how we need to design the, the, the workplace. Question I'm asking here is, this is a person uh, breeding cows, behind the cows, he's in a parlor. He seems to be fairly comfortable. Uh, there's not much there that indicates uh, that he is in, in not a pleasant environment and there's no really reason to believe from this picture that he couldn't do his job real well. My question is if that same person would be working here in minus 10, 20 or 30 with a snowstorm going on. Is this person going to perform the same quality job or not? He might be a great breeder, but if he's working in these kind of conditions, or when it's 102 outside, which can happen here in New Mexico very easily, um, is he going to perform the same kind of job, the same quality job? So the question I'm asking is, we design typically dairies around cow comfort. And this is a class in cow comfort. Uh, Dr. Gordy Jones is, is uh, uh, in our industry, probably considered the godfather of, of the term cow comfort. And these are some of those talking points about how we want to make sure that our cows are comfortable. We want to make that our MO, our, our modus operandi. The, qu the same question I can ask, are we doing this also for our employees? Do we design dairies around worker comfort? I still see dairies, for example, where the cows wa walk on rubber uh, to make it comfortable to go come to the parlor, yet milkers may still be standing on concrete. And so their poor performance is going to be impacted by that environment ergonomically to maximize worker performance. So what do all these things now mean in terms of animal welfare? Animal handling is much more an art than it is a task. As we've said before, it takes two to tango. Correct animal handling starts the day the animal is born and continues for a lifetime. It's not just something that is once in a while or maybe from four to five in the afternoon. It is a, it is a commitment that continues for a lifetime. Animal handling skills are learned slowly by observing and practicing over and over again. That doesn't speak very well for those that come to a dairy and don't have that experience. It takes a long time to become a good animal handler. Given that animal handling is a skill set, the question really needs to be asked, what human personality traits does a cow handler need to possess? And that, of course, will then answer the question, did we select the right people for the job? So it's really important to go back and make sure that we hire the people that have the skill sets or that we can give the skill sets and practice with to do the right job. This is from personal experience. Dairies where handlers understand why they are doing what they are doing, the comprehension part. Cows are calmer, they're more curious, and they're less fear fearful of humans and human interactions. 
And every time when I do this presentation for producers and I talk about this, I get a lot of nodding heads. A lot of people will agree with this, with this uh, experience. So animal well-being really benefits if we teach and train employees on the skills and the knowledge, as I've said before. Those are the parts that we can hand to these people, that we can uh, instill in, in our workers, and uh, we can teach and train those. However, the part, and this is what takes certain teams to the Super Bowl or be winners, which is focusing on coaching. And that is really what we want to do as owners and managers. We want to coach attitudes. Attitudes, as we've said, are very difficult to change, but we want to coach and, uh, on these attitudes towards working with large animals. Things like motivation, confidence, integrity, honesty, enthusiasm, and commitment. Those are some of the attitudes that we want to coach for. Employees typically mean well, but if you can't anticipate what an animal is going to do, it's very easy to get frustrated, and frustration is the perfect setup for the wrong outcome and possible animal mishandling or abuse. I think that this is where we end up with some of those videos. Human well-being or safety concerns increase with the lack of understanding of what a 1,500-pound animal can do. Cows have great memories, they recognize people well, and they know real well who treats them well or not. It's something that sometimes we overlook. As we've said, learned behavior is an important component of that animal, human-animal interaction equation. In conclusion, uh, a culture of care begins by accepting that animal welfare doesn't live in a vacuum. It is the result of a correct or a mindful human-animal interaction the two-legged animal in this equation, right? Which is a commitment. Ultimately, it starts at the top and it trickles down. It has to come from example. We have to set that at the top. It is the result of people interacting correctly with animals, understanding and anticipating how animals will respond to the pressure that we exert on them. It is jeopardized and compromised by misunderstanding herding behavior and cow senses. And those, of course, are the things that we want to teach and instill in our employees. And it is also jeopardized or compromised by incorrect human behavior around animals. It is an outcome. It's the positive outcome between a human and an animal. And so with that, uh, thank you for your attention. And I will uh, turn this back over to, uh, to Michelle. Uh, just one more thing, the, uh, in my slides, there are two slides after this that have resources for producers. So those of you that may want to look for additional resources, there's two slides after this that will actually um, uh, show those resources for you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hagavor. Um, I. I, I, I always appreciate your perspectives and there's, there's so many wonderful take home messages uh, from your slides. And I can't wait till we dig into that a little bit more um, when we get the Q&A going. So if we can get Josh, um, Josh up now so we can uh, hear his perspectives. Um, we'll go ahead and see if he can share his screen. I'm, I'm still tackling my techno technology issues. So I apologize to the audience, but um, I think I hopefully you all can hear me okay and we can keep the conversation going. So Josh, I think you're on mute. There we go. Can you hear there me? There we go. Yeah, I can. Thanks so much. So Excellent. Josh, again, thanks for joining us today in this important conversation. You already heard some some really great points by Dr. Hagavort. So really interested in hearing from you, um, from your perspective and from that of the Mashoffs. You know, how do you all instill a culture of care throughout the company? And Josh, why don't you also tell us how your role plays a part in that? Sure. Uh, so at the Mashoffs, uh, you know, we look at the culture of care as, as really everybody in the business's obligation to one another. Um, and, and, you know, caring for the employees, caring for our animals is, is you know, our top priority. So um, when we look through the individual roles and, and responsibilities in the company, me as a general manager, um, you know, I look at the, the commitment to care is an employee first commitment to care that, um, you know, we have to ensure that our employees are, are well cared for, they have a safe work environment, 
Um, they fit well culturally with one another. Uh, they're trained on their jobs and their tasks uh, on a daily basis to ensure the care of the animals. And so uh, really we look at this as an individual basis too, that uh, each person has a special set of skills uh, and each person's unique in their own way. And so it's, it's really working with individuals to find what skills they have and where we can apply those to be the most successful for them um, to really thrive inside the environment in our farms. And then uh, we also have a lot of people that, you know, drive truck, uh, work in feed mills and, and things of that nature. So that requires a different set of skills. So if we try to treat everybody as, as one, and we have the same training program for everybody, uh, we, we wouldn't be near as successful as we are. So finding those things, being very specific to the, to the job, very specific to the individual, uh, we have individual onboarding plans uh, for people in the first 30, 60, 90, 120, and then continue out uh, even past that. Uh, and not only is it uh, onboarding plans for their day-to-day -day tasks, but also integrating them into the business and support divisions to where they can reach out for help, whether it's from nutritionists or our vets on staff, uh, the HR department, accounting, uh, and so it's, it's kind of a holistic approach to just make sure that each individual um, can get what they need when they need it to be successful. And we think that's what the culture of the mashoffs is. And if we have that for our people, by, by and large, that filters down to the animal care on farm, their husbandry skills. And then, uh, you know, our goal is, is to retain these people. And so through that type of structured uh, onboarding training and coaching platform, uh, retention is, is one of the key focuses to ensure that, you know, we have the right people on a daily basis. And so again, going back to my specific role in, in the region I run, um, is we want to hire the right people for the right job and then promote a, a culture that gets them to be successful. And so, uh, also allowing them to, to have the ownership and, and decision-making to, you know, have a positive outcome when they're working on projects or working on farm is, is extremely important to us as well, that allowing them, you know, the bandwidth and the autonomy to make individual decisions because every farm runs different. Uh, and so every farm's going to have a specific uh, little niches. And so if, if uh, we don't treat every farm as, as its own uh, and kind of blanket the approach, we, we wouldn't have the success that we have. So I think, I think that's one of the, the big keys at the mash offs is they've allowed that decision-making uh, to come out and, and down to the field level. That, that's really great, Josh. And you know, um, that just goes to show how there's lots of different approaches and strategies out there. Um, and it sounds like what you all have going on really, really works. Um, I'd like to ask you, so the Mashoff Zone is about 80% of its sow farms, right? Um, and there are critics out there that that raise the concern that larger or corporate owned farms don't value animal welfare. And clearly you just talked through how much animal welfare means to the mash offs. So what would you, what would you say to that notion by those critics? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I would say they're wrong. Uh, and really I think about this in two ways is we have owners, uh, the mash off family and leadership, Dr. Bradley Walters, Dr. Jay Miller, um, you know, that, that have allowed the piece of, of ownership, uh, down to the farm level. So yes, we have the owners, but when we talk about, about the success and, and the farm level, you know, where we operate in different states and different cultures, different communities, the ownership piece is what I really think is key uh, to that is, is each individual farm, each individual person uh, is responsible for the ownership. And so what, what's unique, I think, is the Mashoff family has, has trusted the employees with the ownership piece. So they've They've allowed uh, individual farms, sow farms in particular, um, to really run their own P&L, um, their profit and loss statements. And so if you're part of that farm, you're also part of the, the outcome of that farm. And uh, they've, they've really fostered that type of mentality inside of the, the farm and, and production level that we trust and instilled in you guys the power to make the best decision to run that farm and to provide for yourselves, your families while doing that. And so I think that's, that's extremely important to me as an employee. And I know the people that also work under me that, that they, they own uh, the outcome. So we talk about the owners being the Mashoff family, but I feel as the employees, we have the ownership uh, of our day-to-day -day obligation to the animals, to the performance of that farm. 
And uh, that's, that's one of the great things about the business too, is we're regionalized. So we have the, the, the commercial regions, uh, we operate in different areas. So we know what, what those areas need and we're able to, to make those decisions to provide the best outcome. And I think the other thing that, that really goes well with that is, is, you know, the farm level, you can make your decisions from staffing. So getting the right culture of people to come there to work with you the people that have the same values that you do on an individual farm basis. And then the other thing that I really like is, is we try to source the employees that are close uh, together in the same communities. So not only do you have the work life, but you also have a personal life outside of there that keeps you close together and, and continues to keep you, you know, working towards the common goal. That's great. Sounds like a, like a model that's trying to account for on-farm considerations, but also off-farm. And, and obviously, right, our workers are humans like us, right? They all that's have right. on-farm and off-farm days, right, that may be on or off. But, um, but that, that's, a, that's a wonderful explanation. And it just goes to show, again, there's lots of different resources and capabilities out there. And just because there's a larger scale operation or company doesn't necessarily mean that that's a bad thing, that that can actually be a great thing in your case. Uh, so. Last question I've got for you, Josh. Um, as Dr. Hagevort mentioned, animal welfare doesn't live in a vacuum. And when we think about the broader context and how animal welfare matters in the, the large scheme of things, it falls under this big sustainability umbrella, right? So um, a culture of care obviously isn't then going to be just focused on animal welfare or yeah, animal care. We also have to consider things like the environment, right? So how, do, how does the Mashoffs um, ensure that the company is operating sustainably? Sure. So I'd say one of the one of the top things about our sustainability is is uh, you know we have an entire department, uh, the environmental team, dedicated to our sustainable practices, uh, and that's ensuring that we're we're compliant on construction permits. You know if we want if we're building a new farm, uh, we meet all the regulations not only you know at the state but local level, uh, permits, um, CAFO permits, uh, environmental permits, construction design statements, and so. I think, you know, there's that bucket of the regulatory compliance that, that, you know, we all abide with. You, you have your set of rules and regulations, but I think too, what, what also is very unique is, is we have 600 uh, production partners uh, that are independently own and operate their own farm in a partnership with us. So on the finishing side of the business and the majority of those guys uh, also are row crop farmers. And so it's, it's really this, big push for them to be as, as efficient and sustainable as possible as well, because the, the nutrient that the, the animals are providing are going right back out on their corn fields. Uh, and then the corn's growing again to, uh, to come back through the co-op and the feed mill to come back to the hog barn. So, uh, you know, those guys are extremely diligent. Um, all manure management and application records are up to date on farms. Uh, we continue to, to look for alternative options, whether it's, uh, I know in the state of Iowa where I live, a lot of guys have gone to cover cropping um, after manure application and things of that nature. So it's really, you know, we talked about the environment and, and the regulatory side, the, the compliance and application side and the efficiency is really a way of life for a lot of our farmers. Because as you guys all are aware that uh, the, the beef side, pork side, poultry side, uh, and row crop side, there's not a lot of margin in it today. But if you do it all together in conjunction of, you know, being responsible at raising your livestock, being responsible with your nutrient management plans, and uh, you put it all together in, in kind of one package, uh, you can create quite a sustainable little farm for you in, in uh, western Iowa. So uh, I think, you know, that's the focus is, is making sure that we meet all regulatory, we're compliant at all times, but then really going above and beyond with how can we be as resourceful as we possibly can? How can we use our manure application um, to be as responsible as we can? And then, you know, how can we bring that back around as the holistic approach of putting it back into the, the co-op, the feed mill, back out into the pigs in the barn? Awesome. Thank you so much, Josh. Really appreciate Thank those you. perspectives. Hey, Max, can I get you up now? And we got a few questions for you and really interested in hearing your perspectives. Sure. How are you? Good, Max. I'm, my, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do this whole thing off my phone, so bear with me. <laughs> no worries. So, 
So Max, let's, uh, to get started with your thoughts, um, how do you maintain a culture of care in your family's feedlot business? And how is this culture of care and animal welfare as a topic important to your operation? Well, the culture of care, it, to me, it starts at the top, right? So if you're not implementing that and making it an important part of really every decision that you make, then it's not going to get translated down any lower than that. Um, no one's going to care about it. You're not going to measure it. You're you'll have some level of care that they care about themselves, but it won't be necessarily to your standards or to you what you want. Um, to me, the culture of care not only extends, not only like Josh had said, not only just past the animals, but everything that you do, your employees, the land that you take care of, all of it. Um, so for me, I, I kind of think of cult, a culture of care in somewhat as, a, of a, as being a servant leader and the fact that you are putting that, that animal or that employee or that piece of ground before needs before your your own needs and at the end of the day we're all better off for that that's fantastic yes and so obviously um this is very complex right and it's not there's no black and white solution or one golden you know ticket in terms of figuring that out and how that works across all operations right so what unique challenges come with building a culture of care within a family business and how do you suggest navigating them so the the first one for a family business is you have both on farm and off farm people and so I'll, let's just take my family's business, for example. Um, we have first, second, third, and now we're getting into fourth generation. Uh, some of the fourth generation people and even some of the third generation people have been involved in the farm, but they've never, maybe never worked at the farm. Um, they don't know what it takes to, to necessarily go out there and take care of the animal or, or take care of the farm ground, any of that. So how do you translate that and let them know what, what being an Arctic in this particular case means. What does that culture of care mean? The other part is there is some generational differences on the culture of care. Um, there are some different expectations between what my uncle's or my dad's expectation is as opposed to what some of the, my millennial cousin's uh, expectations are. So how do you translate that? How do you get that? Uh, for, for me and for us, we've kind of set up a family vision um, and mission, and we believe that that's the way that we need to, to operate it. Um, and, and it still comes back to constant communication, making sure that that culture of care is reflective in everything that you do as much as you possibly can, making sure that you reinforce it with whoever your leaders are that can help continue to go down the path. The other part that I would say makes it uh, that d defining piece is kind of what Dr. Hagevort was speaking at the beginning is not only do we have a culture of care for what that means for me and my family, now I have different cultural backgrounds and expectations as to what a cultural form of care will mean. So how do I, how do I get that engagement from, in this case, from that employee on defining that culture of care? It's a challenge. There is no I'll say that we've made as many steps as we go forward. We probably go backwards on some other ones. So, but it is a constant challenge. But I think staying the course, being due diligent, investing in, in having people go to different ag alliances and trainings and, and getting to hear what other people do, that, that's, that's the best way to navigate it and being constant and proactive with it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with you, Max. Um, so final question I've got for you um, uh, is, again, this idea that animal welfare, right, it doesn't, or the culture of care doesn't live within the vacuum alone of animal welfare. And so the approach um, may, may, may extend to that of being, good, uh, being a good neighbor, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just wondering, again, as we talked about animal welfare and environmental sustainability, just wondering what advice you have for ensuring positive relationships, uh, not just with, within our communities, but also with our neighbors as that extends within this culture of care? Uh, number one, I would say is be proactive. So think ahead of the curve, what that means for you. Um, that, that, that's the biggest piece I think right there is be proactive. The second part I think of is to be involved. So be involved in your local community, uh, support local events. Uh, and when I use the term community, I'm gonna also say within your region as well, as well as your industry there. I don't think it stops. Um, it kind of goes back to that servant leadership, right? Be, be a leader, be out there, put the needs of the industry that we work in and your employees ahead of, ahead of yours. And the second part, the third one I would say is be 
community educate and outreach. I would say that there's not really anything that we do that's necessarily a big trade secret or a secret. So educate people, let them know. It's amazing how many people, even in rural America, still really don't know where your food comes from or what it comes, how it gets there. Um, and so educating individuals, getting them out to the dairy farms or out to the ranches to see what everybody does, how we take care of our animals, how we take pride in what we do, all of those are extremely important. Wonderful. Wonderful suggestions, Max. Thanks so much. So um, why don't we go ahead and have all the panelists come back on. I'm going to try and see. Um, looks like we've got a few questions. Um, uh, but I can go ahead and get started with one for you, Dr. Uh, let's see. Got, got a couple here for you to just bring some of those concepts back up that you spoke about earlier today, and then I'll, I'll jump over those Q&As. But um, so one thing we talked about again is, is um, being able to make sure that animal welfare benefits when we're able to focus on coaching, uh, right? Um, coaching with uh, our employees and, 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 and workers. Um, and I'm wondering, in part of that coaching, you talked about confidence and being able for employees to be very comfortable, especially when we think about animal welfare, that tends to be a very sensitive and critical area. So do you have any suggestions or from your experience seeing some successful strategies and how we can help make sure that employees feel comfortable reporting animal welfare concerns immediately? Um, yeah, it, goes, it, it all goes back, like you just said, to confidence. Uh, I, I think if people have confidence in what it is that they do with animals, if they understand animal behavior, you know, how an animal is going to respond to that pressure that we put on an animal, whatever it is that we're doing, bringing them to the parlor, loading them in a truck. If, if people understand herding behavior, because that's in the case of, of, of cows, that, that, that's what, what it is. If they understand herding behavior and they're confident that they can approach that 1500 pound animal without getting hurt in the process, process um, they get more confident about what it is that they do, right? Uh, then they also are confident to see, and, and those of us that have worked with animals all our lives, I mean, I can stand a mile away from, a mile is, is a long distance, but I can stand a long ways away from the corral of animals and see people work animals and I can see when they're doing it right or when they're doing it wrong. Uh, it's very obvious. So there, there's that confidence. If people, employees truly understand what it is that they're doing when it comes to these animals, they would also have the confidence to speak up and say, wait, you know, you, can, you don't have to be in that pen with 50 people trying to get one cow out. If you understand herding behavior, just one or two people can get that job done doing it right. And so you can step in with confidence and, and, and instruct or teach uh, those that are doing it at that point in time. Or you can also walk to your superior and say, wait a minute, you know, you, these guys, uh, I saw today what they were doing, and I, I tried to explain how to do this, but it, it didn't go over real well. And so I, that confidence is, works both ways, both working with the animals, but also being able to speak up and say, wait a minute, this is, you know, there's an easier or a better way to do this. And if, if we did it this way, we would do the same thing with less, in less time, with less energy, and, and much less stress on the animal. Great, great perspectives. Um, so got another question that came up, and Josh, I'll, get, I'll hand this one to you. Uh, and this one's a very relevant one right now. So given our current situation with COVID-19, do you have advice about how we can care for employees and animals and share that commitment with the public? I'm not hearing you, Josh. Oh, there we go. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, you know, a couple of the things that I think we can do uh, and I'll start around the employee uh, side of this is, is it's, you know, one thing that we implemented early uh, in this pandemic was, uh, you know, if, if you don't feel well, just stay at home and, and, you know, protect yourselves, but also that protects the other people from the farm or, or around you. And so it, it was really, you know, taking the approach of if something's not right, we'll figure out how to cover, we'll figure out how to manage through this. You take care of yourself, take care of your family, uh, and, and recover as soon as possible. And so I think, you know, 
just really putting the, the employee first, allowing them um, to feel comfortable that, that if they're able to have, you know, a phone call with uh, their leader and say, hey, something doesn't feel right, I have a cough, I have a fever, uh, and then just being courteous to them and putting, you know, kind of some, some steps in place that, uh, you know, follow right along with the guidelines of the CDC and local uh, and regional healthcare is, uh, you know, let fevers clear 72 hours before returning to work, um, get tested, have your 14 days down uh, if you were positive, things of that nature. Uh, and so it, it really was just allowing those people the comfort and confidence that, you know, we're here for you. We're going to be here when you come back to work. Please take care of yourself and uh, take care of your family. And so then that comes, you know, what happens if multiple people are out at the same time and how do you cover things and still continue to keep your, your employees safe while keeping your animals safe. And so uh, we really went through kind of a day-to-day. -day. This was a living plan that uh, the COVID-19 task force, I would say, that we have at the company uh, worked through on how do we handle this. And so we, we really just kind of sat down and walk through scenarios until we got what we thought was a, a plan um, on how to cover labor and manage through a situation like this. So I, th I think really the, the best answer to all this was is, is early on in this, we, we went through a process and, and assigned a task force of people for specific things around what happens for animal care when we have people out, what happens to the people and, uh, and allowing those people then, you know, to have the decision-making power on here's what's going to work best. And then we, as a, as a general management group and employees carry that message forward to all the people and, and uh, farms that we impact that, Hey, here's what we're going to do. Um, it might not have been perfect. We learned a lot the first couple of uh, weeks and, and had to shift course based on guidelines, but uh, it, it really came down to just a living, breathing document that had to be altered on a day-to-day -day and, and now it's more of a week-to-week -week basis, but it, it was a living document that, that had to continue to evolve uh, and still does have to evolve, unfortunately. But uh, I would say that was the best approach we did. And, and so far we've, we've been able to manage through it. Uh, employees are, are well cared for and the animals then have, have uh, also been managed through this time. That's really great. And the other part to that question was kind of sharing that commitment with the public have you all found any strategies and how to do how to do that effectively? Um, we've shared some of it with uh, you know with our local public. Obviously, people have questions, concerns uh, a lot around um, the packing side of of the industry we're in today. And so, um, you know, there's been a lot in the news about the packing side of things. And our message continues, you know, to be the that uh, we're, we're really trying um, to feel our way through with human safety uh, as the top priority. So uh, that message has, has been coming out uh, loud and clear, I think, from not only the pork industry, but also the, the company at the mash-offs that uh, we want everybody to be safe and we want everybody to operate in a safe manner um, so we can get back to business as usual, uh, whatever that may be in the, in the coming months. It, it may never get back to business as usual. We all hope that. Um, but but uh, you know that's the that's the stance is we want everybody to be safe so we can we can continue to uh, to get back to business. Absolutely, thank you, thank you, Josh. I've got a question for you, Max. Uh, so while servant leadership is kind of self defining, what key character traits would you say a servant leader has to have? Uh, first key character trait I would say is they need to be humble. They need to be willing to leave from behind and not have to be up front. Uh, second character trait I would say is um, they, they need to have empathy so they need to be able to show that they care um, be able to kind of put themselves in that person's shoes how would they feel about it uh, that kind of that, that kind of character trait. I'm not sure I can I'm not sure that's a real good def definition of that but um, and then finally they need to I don't know if it's a character trait, but they kind of need to feel like they belong to a, a higher purpose. And what I mean by that is they need to feel like they're, what they're doing belongs to something else. Um, and I wrote it down and, and Dr. He Dr. Hebegert said it the best is connecting the why and what. They need to be able to do that and really feel that, not necessarily just feel it. It needs to kind of be part of their 
their DNA, their kind of inner being. Their, that's why they do what they do is that, is that reason, so. Right, thank you, Max. And, and again, that goes back to all the points made by the panelists, right, where again, retention rates are not as high as we'd like them. And so a lot of efforts go in, right, to when we finally do hire people and they're the right ones, they've got all of those right traits that we keep them, right? And that they, they actually enjoy what they do and they do it well every single day, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And uh, next question uh, here we've got, it says, Dr. Hagevort spoke to the shifts in employees within the dairy industry. Can the other speakers comment on any shifts that they are seeing within the pork and beef industries? Are you seeing similar shifts like the increase in foreign labor and other spoken languages? So Josh, uh, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you first on that one. Um, sure. Um... I don't know if we're seeing necessarily a shift in labor, but we are, we're, we're seeing a, a need um, for labor is kind of how I describe it. Um, and we're finding that a lot of ways through, you know, T and visa worker programs, things of that nature. Um, but I would say that, that labor is a big part of the conversation on a daily basis. And uh, I would, I would continue to, to think that, uh, you know, our visa work programs are going to be a, a big part of, um, the labor force that we have, you know, pork, beef, poultry, whatever that may be uh, in the coming years. And the one thing I think that, that uh, I would say is, you know, kind of changing is, is really how do we adapt to that uh, when you think about the pork industry in, in um, a, a Midwestern, um, you know, type environment, right? A lot of, of Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois, uh, Missouri uh, production bases. And so it's, it's really finding ways that, that we can integrate those people into our culture and communities, um, you know, through the visa program. And so we've, uh, we've continued to, to work towards that and continue to look for, you know, opportunities to get those uh, employees involved in our business. And what we're finding is, is uh, as we do, they're very good and, and very loyal uh, employees. So I think that's a, a big part of what I think people have to understand is, is if, if, you know, you can integrate them into your workforce. Um, they're, they're very good employees for a, a long period of time. So um, I would say we're, we're constantly evolving on the employee front. Absolutely. I've, I've seen a lot of su success through those visa programs as well on the beef side. Max, uh, any thoughts to add there? I can I meet myself there? Um, I would kind of echo what Josh had said is that I, I can't really tell you whether the demographics are changing from as far as cultures. What I can say is the demographics are changing from an age perspective and that it's harder to find ex uh, good experienced managers um, that they just don't really, I'll be honest, I don't really know that they exist. Um, they're, they're extremely difficult to find. Um, and so I, a lot of the best way to do it is to kind of what everybody's been saying is find the employees that you like, train them, develop them in, in, in your culture of care so that they're ready to take on those succession roles and those leadership roles later on down the road. Um, I will say that there's also kind of been a trend. Um, there is becoming more of a trend anyway towards more like um, robotics and some of those kinds of stuff. And that's probably a hard, that's probably a hard trend. I don't think see that's going to change anytime soon um, at all. So. Sure, sure. Uh, Dr. Hagevoort, I've got a really great question for you. Um, and this, this person wants to know your view on monitoring animals and people with cameras. And you talked about different approaches and training uh, perspectives there. And so they want to know, um, can recorded video be used for training and continuous improvement as opposed to those gotcha kind of activities? Uh, so what, what, are, what are your thoughts in monitoring animals and people with cameras? I, I think they're great tools. And again, I mean, you pointed out already, it's, it, it is not about gotcha. It, it is about being able to see uh, how people really understand. Like I just said a minute ago, you know, I can stand quite a ways away from a corral where people are working animals. And I can tell uh, by how the animals are responding or by how the people are responding if, if they understand what is going on. And so they're great educational opportunities. I've got video that I've taken that I use for training, um, you know, even with the permission from these folks that I, that I video, uh, just to illustrate and demonstrate uh, how to maybe do it differently instead of trying to chase cows all around the corral. 
uh, you know, using that hurting behavior to let her actually walk out or, you know, where we want her to go. And, and so it goes to understanding how a cow is going to respond and why a cow or a pig or what it is that, or, or you know, what we're talking about, whatever animal it is, using that animal's instinct, innate behavior in our benefit. If we understand that, we're in a much better place. Let the animal work for you instead of trying to work you work in the animal. Um, you know, and that is on the beef side, it's on the pork side. Um, and it's something that does not come easy. It's something that takes a long time to develop to be able to understand what goes on in the mind of that animal and be able to anticipate what that animal is going to do based on, on his or her behavior, right? On his mm -hmm. behavior. And, and if we can anticipate what an animal is going to do based on its innate or its natural behavior, we can just let the animal do the work. So I, I think they're great tools. Uh, I, I use them. They can be used very beneficently. Um, and of course, I mean, there's, there are drawbacks on it, but we, we all know and understand that. But I, I look at the positive side, how it can be used. Absolutely. And I think it goes back to what we all talked about earlier, that this those videos and sometimes just having a worker see themselves interact with those animals it, it doesn't just illustrate the how and the what, but the why. And we can really help illustrate a lot of those principles. So Absolutely. thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. Hannah, I've got one minute left. Um, and we've got lots of great questions still here. Uh, my, do, do I have the reins to keep going? Do, do our panelists still have another couple minutes to answer a few questions? We still have a lot of people on the line. So as long as you guys are, are okay for another few minutes, as everyone does know, everything's being recorded. So if you do have to jump off and then want to circle back and watch later, that will be available to you. But if you guys don't mind going on for a few minutes, we still have quite an audience. Michelle, I, Michelle, I have a, uh, on one of the questions Kay asked about the uh, current COVID situation and, and advise mm -hmm. how we care for employees. I, if I may maybe add one, one more comment to that question. Of course. I think Max and Josh did a great job in answering that question. But I think also it's important to um, realize if we're talking about foreign-born labor and, and linguistic challenges, uh, uh, maybe a lack of education, one thing where I really see an opportunity for owners, for managers, for extension in the role that I play is is an educational role as we learn more about this virus the respiratory virus as we learn more about it, its behavior what it does what it doesn't do um i think there's a really critical role for us to not instill fear but to talk about what we do know about this virus what it does and doesn't do um, so that employees because of these challenges linguistic challenges uh and others they may not understand what this virus is. I mean, do some of the employees, I mean, some of these young kids that, that have come across that are working now in agriculture, do they know the difference between, uh, say, bacteria and a virus? Do they know what that virus will do? Do they know how it compares to a regular flu virus? Do they know those kind of things? As we learn more about this virus, I think there is a unique opportunity um, for those of us in agriculture that, that are in this role of teaching and educating and sharing and building um, you know, our employees and our businesses to really talk about as we learn, and we're all in this process of learning more about COVID-19, which I didn't know anything about six or eight weeks ago. Um, I knew something about coronaviruses because we have those in livestock, but as we learn about this particular one, I think we have a unique opportunity and an obligation to share it with our employees and talk about those things as we learn. Um, I just think that I, I wanted to add that to that. And I, I can't wait for our governor to lift, lift uh, the, uh, the, the lockdown so that we can actually go out and um, maybe in a different setting that we used to do before, that we can go out to, to these farms and, and actually sit down uh, even if it is social distancing with social distancing and whatever is needed to sit down with those employees and have a conversation about this and one-on-one -on -one about what it is that we're dealing with and to not to fear this, but maybe respect this, this virus and how to learn to live with it as we go forward. Absolutely. And, and that, those are some really important thoughts there, right? Because that's kind of what we're going through in society with everything else, right? We're, 
We're trying to learn and adapt and do what's right. And as Max said earlier, constant communication is something that's really essential to keep our employees, again, not just um, in line with the vision and the commitment, but to keep them empowered and, and know that they matter too. And so uh, thank you for, for bringing up that very important point um, because we're all currently doing that ourselves, right, in society. So I'm gonna go look back at the question box. Um, so the next one, guys, is for Josh and Max. And says here, with the closures of slaughterhouses and wanting to be transparent, how do you address the questions of what is happening to these animals that are ready to ship? Uh, Josh, maybe you can maybe you can start with start with that. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, there's there's been a lot of conversation, a lot of um, you know questions. I guess I'd say about what are we going to do with with uh, the livestock that, that can't make it to slaughter. Um, to date, we have not had to euthanize any animals. I know that's the top of everybody's list. Um, there's been multiple facet approach to this uh, on part of, uh, of the task force at the mash offs on how do we, how do we continue to, um, you know, keep pigs being weaned out of sow farms, put them into barns that potentially, you know, should have, already had market animals moved out of it to packing plants, things of that nature. The first thing I would say is, is uh, the, the way that we've been handling it is there's been a huge team effort um, between the packing industry and the producers um, on, you know, how can we and what can we do for one another um, to not have to, um, you know, euthanize these animals um, and, and continue to get them in the food chain. And so we've, we've changed some diets uh, to back up, you know, to, to slow growth down, add a lot of fiber back to diets just um, to keep pigs from putting weight on. Um, and then again, you know, looking for available opportunities to, to move pigs from a site to another site um, so we can continue to wean out of sow farms and, and get other barns filled up. But the end goal is for, for us to continue to search for, uh, strategic ways inside the pork industry, inside of our business to uh, get all those pigs to market. Um, mass euthanasia is the very last resort. Uh, and like I've mentioned so far to date, we uh, at the mass shops have not had to execute that measure. Um, we've been very nimble, uh, very flexible. And uh, I, would, I would say that the teamwork aspect um, of the pork industry as a whole has, uh, has really helped us through this time the past, uh, really, I'd say four weeks. I look for it to continue um, for probably an extended period of time longer than maybe we even think, um, but we'll continue to search for every alternative um, to ensure that, that while you know, there are, are short supply, uh, it seems kind of crazy to talk about that euthanasia aspect, but our goal is to, to search for every opportunity in every avenue we can um, to get those pigs into the supply chain uh, some way or another. Thanks, Josh. And, and it, that is such a hard topic and it's, it's such a heartbreaking situation. And um, I know there's been lots of wonderful resources being put, uh, available to, to all producers um, to, again, help them communicate with the veterinarians um, and with experts to help ensure that if this step needs to be taken, that it's done humanely, um, but also resources for our people because that severely impacts all of the workers that have raised those animals every single day, right? And so I uh, just want the audience to be aware there's lots of great resources out there to help support, again, those that interact with the animals and the animals themselves. Um, Max, do you have any additional thoughts to add there? Just a little, it's a little different in, in beef, um, but we are doing the ration slowdowns, trying to not, you know, not put on the weight, some of that kind of stuff. There has been a movement here probably in the last week or so to do like a set aside, kind of set them aside to get, try to get some sort of a reimbursement. We'll see if that actually goes anywhere and gets approval or not, but just to kind of slow them down. We realize it is a, I mean, we don't want to con continue to feed, fatten them up and feed them up if we uh, sure. if unnecessarily. So at the end of the day, we all are, we all want to make sure that the animals get, get to market, that they're taken care of uh, and that they're treated humanely their entire life. So. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Let's do, there's, let's do one more, the last question there. I think that'll help us end on a positive note. Uh, so I'll let you do that, that last question, Michelle, and then we'll wrap things up. 
This, this one on top, okay. Um, so Dr. Hagevoort, I'll hand this one to you. So it says consumers are concerned about animal welfare and many state that it can influence their purchase decision at the shelf. How do you recommend bridging the gap with consumers around animal welfare? As I don't think there's an awareness on the culture of care. Boy, that's a, that is a, you know, that's the million dollar question right there, right? Um, right. And, and I think, you know, we all realize and understand how far consumers are away from where their food is produced, right? And, and we sometimes use that as an excuse, and I don't think it's an excuse. But I also think that a lot of farmers, uh, dairymen, pig farmers, hog farmers, uh, you know, on the beef side, are doing a marvelous job of not just looking at how do we produce stuff, but are coming out of their corner and talking about what it is that they do. Here at the Ag Animal Ag Alliance, we, you know, uh, at the summit, there's been a history of bringing farmers to talk about what it is that they do. Uh, here, this panel uh, brings farmers to the forefront to talk about what it is that they do so that folks that have a genuine interest, not a genuine in interest in an, in an agenda to put down animal agriculture, but a genuine interest to learn about where their food comes from, that they can actually learn. You know, this word transparency, we always talk about being transparent. A lot of producers never thought you know, maybe a generation back that they would have to open the barn doors to show what it is that they're doing because they figured we're producing human food and we're producing it in a sustainable, what they believe a sustainable way. And, and we, you know, work much further along as we are today than what we were back then. Now we open barn doors. We've learned to communicate. A farmer may not always be the greatest communicator, but they got a great story to tell. And so I think that they are learning how to tell that story to the folks in their family, to the folks in their community, to the folks at large. And so um, that communication is critical, is absolutely critical to show people um, also about, you know, it, I mean, we're when we're dealing with cows, we're talking about 1,500 pound animals that can do, that can hurt us if, if we don't do things right. So it's not always about that cow. It's also about the employee and that interaction, as I talked about, to do things right. And so if, if the consumer understands how these things work and, and learn about that through communication, and I think that that is what the industry as a whole is learning how to do that, communicate and, and, and do that correctly, properly, and, in, and engage with the consumer at that level. There's a lot of consumers out there. It's, it's, a, it's a large number. And there's only very few of us, and, but we're learning. And I think social media is a great tool. You look around and see how many farmers are actually out on social media um, doing these kind of things, taking the risk, you know, to, to be attacked in the process, but still being out there advocating for agriculture. I think it's a, it's a huge opportunity. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Hagevoort, Max, and Josh for taking the time. You all are busy um, and your expertise is, is just greatly appreciated, but mostly thank you all for what you do to uplift the workforce, feed the world, and uphold animal welfare commitments. So thank you so much.